Right. I'm in the woods again in Germany. It's usually what happens when I'm looking for uh, um, German um, Nazi stuff, to be honest with you. So I'm looking, I'm in a place called Reichlin, or not far off anywhere. <clears throat> and at one time, this would have been a proving ground for the Luftwaffe. So we're going to look at some buildings that the uh, Luftwaffe had built in order to, uh, say, practice on them. So why I've got to walk, very sandy. I noticed a couple of uh, comments that they said it's uh, just too if you it's too hard to um, cycle along this path and it's quite hard to walk actually because it's very sandy. So I'm about a mile and a half away from where I need to be. So hopefully a designated path's looking at it. And uh, we'll have a walk down and have a look at what all these uh, these buildings are for. So while we're walking down to these buildings, I'll give you some history of this area and um, what it was used for way back in the 1930s and 40s. Now these buildings I'm looking for, um, they were called the Weisshauser or White Houses in English. I hope I pronounced it right in German. And apparently they were built <coughs> um, to somehow reflect of what uh, Hitler was trying to build if he'd got his own way in uh, Germany, in Berlin. And this, uh, what he was trying to build was a thing called Germania. And well, it was the capital city of uh, Berlin, but he wanted it to be the capital city of the world. So some of these buildings we're looking at, apparently, would have been somewhat similar to what maybe would have been built in Berlin way back. Now there's an army research centre, a good few miles away from here, called Kummersdorf. And that's where the army tested all the, um, the tanks, the vehicles, the bullets, everything that they could possibly use, including captured vehicles as well, just to um, take them apart and see how they worked, just to see what the weaknesses and the strengths were and stuff like that. But the Air Force, especially in the First World War, because um, Kummersdorf had been going since the 1700s, but there was no Air Force then, obviously. Now, the Air Force grew in uh, the First World War, but the Air Force, the uh, German Air Force, didn't have nowhere to test anything. So they decided that this area would be ideal to start testing, um, obviously, new weapons, uh, new um, I'm assuming machinery and stuff because uh, there's an air base a few miles away from here that was the uh, main testing area for the German um, Air Force. So in 1916 the uh, Germans looked for somewhere to um, build some kind of a research facility for a, a, a advancing aeroplanes now. So they picked Reisling right next to the Maritz, Maritz Lake. 1917, they purchased something like 1,400 hectares of what I'm probably walking in now, actually, to do the test, uh, research and test and study of this new technology. And on the 29th of August 1918, the research and testing facilities for the uh, Air Force, <coughs> the work called the Luftwaffe then, uh, opened up in this area. And in September 1918, um, the Air Force were going to start building their very first concrete uh, angers to put the aeroplanes in, obviously. Unfortunately for the Germans, they lost the war and all that stopped. So the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, because the Germans had lost the war, um, they uh, weren't allowed to have any Navy, as far as I remember, no Air Force, no... Um, combat air force and they were limited to something like a hundred thousand men to their army 
So all the infrastructure uh, at the end of the First World War was completely destroyed. However, the Germans had been fighting the Russians in the First World War, but in 1922, uh, both Russia and uh, Germany signed the Treaty of Rapello. Now, that basically said that uh, they weren't going to look at um, any uh, uh, accounting for any territories they may have gained or lost, and they weren't looking for any repatriation between each other, and that made relationships between Russia and um, Germany much stronger. So the Germans then decided, they'd asked Russia, is it okay, can we come and test some of our, our stuff on your land? Because of the Treaty of Versailles, they weren't allowed to do it on their own. So Russia said, yeah, no problem, come along and uh, do some testing and do whatever you need. From 1925 onwards, the Germans set up a secret aviation school on the outskirts of Lipzec, which is a, um, a Russian town. And... Um, this is where they started to um, experiment with new weapons and new technology. Now, one of the loopholes in the Treaty of Versailles was um, they couldn't have an air force, a combat air force, but the Germans could actually set up a civil aviation uh, air force, if you want to class as that. In other words, to ship people backward and forward in different places like that. So what they did was they decided to reopen the areas that were closed off initially in Reichlin, uh, around this area, but a few kilometres further up to the uh, the, the west, and um, they started to um, train the pilots in flying aircraft. Not really for aviation, even though they did, they did use it for that, but obviously for future combat and possible warfare. So, from 1926 to 1933, the um, German government uh, set up an aviation school. They, they started to build hangars and build facilities, workshops, places where the uh, workers could uh, stay and stuff like that. And uh, under the guise, as I said before, of a civil aviation authority. From 1933 onwards, the uh, Nazis came to power, National Socialists. They stuck a lot of money in this area to build it up further, uh, to build more facilities, more people to come and work here, to obviously um, work on better ways and means of producing aircraft and no doubt producing uh, weapons of war. So this area of Reichlin was set into four areas, each with their own um, facility to do whatever they need to do regarding the, uh, now would have been called the Luftwaffe. Group North was administration and laboratories. Group South was motor testing area. East was munitions and weapons. And West was a technical company and barracks. In 1939, the very first uh, jet engine was tested here at Reichlin, um, which um, actually fitted in the Heinkel HE-178. Also, this testing site, um, the Germans didn't just develop aircraft and um, uh, machine, um, sorry, um, weapons technology. They also invented, believe it or not, the uh, ejector seat and uh, also the um, autopilot, the Horton brothers, who um, were quite advanced in aircraft technology, actually um, did some testing along here. Did the Horton uh, 9, which I think was the, uh, the jet plane, the jet, um, would have been the jet fighter, but I don't think it came in production. But they did some testing here, no doubt, on the engines, and they did all the flights over at uh, Oranienburg Airport, which, we, uh, which I've done a previous video on. Now I've got some background into Reichlin and its... Um, it's um, test facilities, which to be honest with you, there's not a lot left, if there's any at all. There's just some really tall buildings down here, which we're going to look at soon. So I'll come along and have a look at these buildings. You see the sort of terrain you've got to put up with to try and find things. These obviously are dead, 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 sort of dedicated paths. This is more than likely so that the forest rangers can get inside here and uh, obviously make sure everything's okay. And it's obviously made for people like me who can walk along. And if you've got, uh, if you're fit enough, you can no doubt use a bicycle. But um, a lot of the paths I saw before was very sandy. And I just ended up pushing the bike, so it just was a waste of time. Very difficult to see now because everything's overgrown. But I'll explain what these towers were for.
Now, the Luftwaffe built for these gigantic structures. Um, they're all overgrown now, so it's difficult. But the idea was, was to um, test them out to see what sort of materials were needed, necessary, to make them more bomb-proof. Uh, and also, they reckon that these, these, um, these concrete structures behind me resemble some of the stuff that uh, Alfred Speer was going to... Alfred, Alfred, Albert. There's four of these uh, concrete uh, monoliths built around this area. With this four right next to each other here. And the idea is, is um, to test out the uh, new concrete and what type of material that was necessary to make it more bomb-proof. Now you can see on the um, places like, for instance, the, um, the submarine pens, where the thickness and the certain type of roofs that they built were virtually bomb-proof anyway, including the Grand Slam and the uh, Tall Boy bombs. Um, these buildings also so supposed to represent something that um, Albert Speer was going to design for the Greater Germania, which was the capital of the world, if uh, Hitler had his own way. And apparently these were a small version of what he may have actually built to go into Germania itself. Now one of the reasons why these things were called the Weisshauser or White Houses is because at one time they had like a white brick facade on the outside. But obviously it's gone now so the locals may have turned them for their own houses, who knows. You can see the, uh, they've got some kind of architectural feature with that little bit there. But you can see how thick the concrete actually is. That's about probably a metre and a half. And you come across here and you'll notice that that there is about a metre in thickness. So they're trying different thicknesses out to see which is the best to withstand whatever bombs that are being um, aimed at it. And that section there is probably, I'd have to guess, at... Um, uh, ooh, let me think, I'd say about 250 millimetres, something like that. Another theory behind this, um, these buildings, because no doubt uh, at the end of the war, the Germans would have done a scorched earth policy and just basically burnt all the blueprints and everything to it. One of the other theories is that uh, they may have been setting it up to um, look like some kind of a village where people would be living, obviously, and they need to make sure that um, maybe if they were building something like uh, air raid shelters, like they did uh, like the, uh, in Zorsen, uh, and all over the place, uh, above ground ones, the uh, Winkle terms, then no doubt they need to test stuff like this. And maybe that's one of the reasons why the, uh, they possibly did build it for this reason. And the, there's, a, there's a good chance it may have been because the Americans in 1943 at Dugway Proving Ground in America built a very similar type of village to destroy it, to see what it would take to destroy villages uh, and towns and cities in um, uh, in Germany, and they called it the German village. In April of 1945, the Germans retreated, they destroyed a lot of this place, scorched earth policy. 2nd of May 1945, the Russians turned up and took over this area. Um, I think one of the reasons why there's no white brick facade here is because I've got a feeling the locals would more likely have turned it to build or repair their own properties. End of the day, they had a war. It had cost millions of lives, it cost millions of money, uh, and a lot of people were uh, uh, displaced. So, in other words, to try and get whatever they could was go and nick stuff. Uh, take all the first head off here and build their own houses. Something like, if you ever see the Egyptian stuff, then you'll notice that the pyramids there, there's nothing much left on the outside of the pyramids because people have been taking bricks off uh, to build their own houses. So, probably exactly the same. And if you go to England on Adrian's Wall, um, 
quite a lot of the walls missing because the locals had taken the walls and built their own houses with them. So you can see um, what happens in uh, times of desperation. I don't think I've got an exact size on these things, but there are the, there's something like probably 20 odd metres tall, which is what, 60, 70 foot and about 10 metres wide. Uh, all sides that is. So what's that 10 metres? That's 30 foot wide, something like that. They're not quite solid. They've got some little entrance in them, but they don't really lead to anywhere as far as I can see anyway. So I'm definitely not going inside the... The story behind this wall is um, a company called Ryan Metals were developing a, a body launcher. They call it, I think it's an anti tank weapon. 38 centimetres across, or 380 millimetres, with 250 kilogram in weight. Now, apparently, this rocket, or whatever the heck it were, was 500 metres away to, to see the penetrative power of trying to get through uh, a concrete block like this. Now, this to me, when I've looked at it closer, Looks as though it's not got a lot of rebar in it. It's got some. It's got like a, a, a mesh on the front of it, which a lot of um, things would do regarding the outer uh, area of mesh. But inside, I can't see any rebar at all. So it's, it's only it's only just normal concrete, about a metre thick. Anyway, the reason why it's like that is because normally when you fire a bullet or a, a, a rocket that penetrates anything, you will tend to find the whole small hole where it goes in and a larger roll like that on the back of it. In this case, it's not. And I think the reason why is because the rockets or the bombs or wherever they were firing at this weren't strong enough to get through a metre of concrete. So what it did was it went through probably 30 centimetres or a foot of concrete, exploded and blew it back open. Hence the reason why it looks like it does with no hole through the back. So Ryan Metals, um, Set up a demonstration in 1939 to try and impress Hitler with these type of weapons. They used a 10 millimeter thick steel plate, fired it, I think, from 100 meters, and it didn't do anything. They used a too thick a plate. They must have overestimated what the capacity of this bomb could do. Um, if they'd used 8 millimeter, they'd gone through, but apparently 10 millimeter, 2 millimeter difference made a difference, and uh, Hitler wasn't impressed. Well, I hope you like that uh, little bit of history regarding Reislin and them towers, the white towers, and that obviously massive concrete structure that's had a big hole blown partly into it. And hopefully I'll see you again on the next video. Thanks a lot. See you again.